Say, boys, if you give me just another whiskey, I'll be glad. And I'll draw right here a picture of the face that drove me mad. Give me that piece of chalk with which you mark the baseball score, and you shall see the lovely Madeline upon the barroom floor. Another drink, and with chalk in hand, the vagabond began to sketch a face that might well buy the soul of any man. Then, as he placed another lock upon that shapely head, with a fearful shriek he leapt and fell across the picture, dead. called it the richest square mile on earth. In the 1840s and 1850s, prospectors had found flecks of gold in the Cherry Creek in Denver and in other streams draining from the Rocky Mountains. John Gregory, an itinerant miner from Georgia, knew those flecks must have washed down from a rich deposit somewhere in the mountains. He wandered up Clear Creek, west of Denver, looking for that source. On May 6th, 1859, Gregory found a rich vein of gold near the North Fork of the Clear Creek. The discovery drew tens of thousands of hopeful miners to the Gregory Diggins, and thus began the gold rush town of Central City. You can't talk about Colorado's history without talking about the gold rush. It really changed the state's history forever. The allure of wealth and the, you know, chance to get rich quick really was what brought tens of thousands of people here beginning in 1858 um, and then into 1859 and 1860. And really one of the biggest discoveries was the run right in Central City. When gold was discovered, the miners who came here to dig the gold out of the ground knew that this was legal for them if they didn't have permission from the tribes, which they never really did. The Native Americans initially ignored and avoided the surging immigrants but conflicts erupted mainly on the plains, resulting in white settlers flocking to Colorado, looking to cash in on the gold boom in the absence of these permissions. And so in the 1860s and 1870s, Central City became one of the biggest towns in the state, not only in terms of population, but also in terms of its wealth and influence. By 1871, the thriving town had churches, schools, banks, music halls, and more. Central City lacked, however, accommodations commensurate with its role as the most prominent town in the Colorado Territory. If you didn't know someone here in town, you would have to stay in, in kind of a, a low-end uh, accommodation where maybe there was a gunny sack filled with hay or straw. And that was what was offered to you in, in Central City with, of course, no in, interior plumbing. The city's leaders badly wanted a hotel that could lend an air of substance and permanence to distinguish it from other boom and busting mining towns where potential investors could stay in comfort. They turned to one of their leading citizens, Henry M. Teller, lawyer, businessman, and politician. Henry Teller played a central role in the early history of Colorado. A puritanical and temperate person, Teller was practicing law in Illinois in 1861 when the gold discoveries in Colorado attracted his attention. Henry Teller was reluctant to come west because it's, it was dangerous and it was far away. And he had to be convinced to come to Colorado. But once he was here, he understood the sheer amount of business opportunity created by all this money being pulled directly out of the ground. And particularly, Henry Teller um, saw the opportunity to invest in the railroad. Teller, whose demeanor commanded attention and respect quickly, became a civic leader in Central City. In the coming decades, he went on to become a tremendously successful businessman, an influential U.S. Senator, a friend of Presidents and Secretary of the Interior. In 1871, Teller and his brother Willard responded to Central City's desire for a luxury hotel and offered to build one. 
provided the town citizens also contributed funds to the effort, which they did. Construction began in the summer of 1871, proceeding as fast as money and men could do it, with torches lighting the building site so work could continue well into the night. In accordance with its gravitas, architect Andy Owen designed an imposing four-story Romanesque structure made of brick. The brick is a local brick. It's actually called the Hooper brick. In some cases, there's gold in the bricks of this building, which is kind of exciting. Those bricks and fire shutters on the windows, as well as the brick Masonic building across the street, helped block the spread of a raging fire in Central City in 1874, saving the town from complete destruction. Teller spared no expense on the building and its furnishings, walnut wood trim and door frames from Chicago, furniture from New York, Chicago, Paris. Chefs and staff from the finest hotels in the East were recruited to serve patrons in a luxurious style. By June 1872, the Teller House was ready for business and Teller staged a grand ball to celebrate the opening of the building. The local newspapers raved about the new luxurious hotel, calling it a masterly piece of work. The parlors are perfect marvels of elegance. All the sleeping rooms, to the number of 90, are tastefully fitted up with all the essential conveniences. Each door is provided with a patent safety lock, which when once the key is turned inside, cannot by any possibility be unlocked from the outside. Guests may therefore lie down in peaceful slumbers, undisturbed by apprehensions of getting their heads blown off or valuables lifted by burglars. Every floor was fitted with a, one full bathroom and two water closets, which was very high end for the time, for sure. The grand staircase in the Teller House is, is just fabulous. The thing that you see when you first walk in the door at the Teller House is the staircase and the Minerva statue at the bottom of the staircase with a little tray. And you set your calling card in the 1800s on the tray and the bellboy would go upstairs to the room of the person that you wanted to see and offer the card. And if you wanted to visit with that person, you would then meet with them on the parlors on the second floor. The rooms were not heated during the day, um, but the second floor parlors were heated, and the first floor, of course. So that's where people would go to socialize and entertain. And people would uh, gather with their friends. They would gather with people coming in from out of town. So the etiquette was very Victorian, and it was enforced. There were rules on the wall of the Teller House when it first opened, and one of the rules were that all unmarried couples were required to use the suitor's chairs while in the parlor rooms. You were sitting in opposite directions, and I suppose it, it was an early form of contraception. The music room of the Teller House was historically the men's parlor, so only men would have been here. There would have been lots of cigar smoking and conspiring for sure. The room directly behind me is called the Governor's Parlor today. It was the women's parlor historically and would have been on the east side of the building to acquire the most of the light. And it was at one point called the Henry Belter Parlor because of the large buffet in the room itself. Henry Belter created a process of steaming together layers of exotic wood with violin glue so that he could create a really amazing piece of furniture. And it's actually amazing that a lot of it still exists today. The Diamond Desk Mirror was very popular here at the Teller House and during that time period because it would give the ladies a sparkle in their face and it would kind of hide some of the discrepancies that they really didn't want to see when they looked at themselves in the mirror. And that is the finest example of a mirror from that time period. With luxurious accommodations available, Central City and the Teller House drew politicians, princes and business titans from across the country and the world to this oasis of civilization in the Wild West. On any given day, the hotel register might list royalty from Europe, exploring adventurers and investors from New York and Chicago seeking riches in the mountains of Colorado. You know, it really was a novelty to have you know, ornate Victorian buildings and cold ice drinks in this really rugged, scary Western landscape. It was a symbol of American ingenuity, American do-it-yourselfness, 
of American grit, symbol of all the things that American prosperity could bring to this untamed savage landscape in the West that was totally lacking, you know, on this mining frontier that had been pretty rough and tumble up until the 1870s. Investors who stayed at the Teller House also made it a thriving business operation with a bank on the first floor, an assay office next door, and the first telephone in Central City used for learning the latest gold prices. On April 28, 1873, the Teller House hosted its most famous visitor, President Ulysses S. Grant, the first sitting president to come to Colorado. The proud citizens of Central City spared no effort or expense in preparation for his visit. They set up a suite on the fourth level of the building, acquired an, an exact replica of the bed from his White House suite and had it delivered here to the Teller House. The streets were crowded with people, the buildings decorated with flags, groups of ladies here and there waving their welcome white handkerchiefs. Their hearts were full and their eyes sparkled with delight. When Grant's carriage pulled up to the Teller House, a path of silver ignits had been laid for his walk to the hotel. Grant was incredulous at the spectacle. Some accounts said he refused to walk on the ignits, although the Daily Register suggested that he did. They were shown to superb rooms on the parlor floor, filled with ladies and gentlemen who called to pay their respects. Men, women, and children put on their happiest humors to enjoy the meeting with the greatest captain of the age. He is the same genial, irresistibly charming fellow he has always been, full of happy sayings, always devoting himself to the work of making those around him enjoy themselves. President Grant and his entourage enjoyed a sumptuous eight-course meal in the richly appointed dining room decorated with flocked red wallpaper. Although the exact menu for that meal is lost to time, a menu from New Year's Day in 1873 demonstrates the extraordinary fare available at the Teller House. Oysters kept cool in mine shafts with ice from nearby snowfields, hump of buffalo calf, and Rocky Mountain black bear. It was all accompanied by fine wine, champagne, and whiskey, which no doubt appealed to Grant's well-known appetite for alcohol. In spite of the extraordinary preparations for his stay, President Grant declined to stay the night, instead riding a stagecoach over the infamous Oh My God Road back to Idaho Springs. In 1877, one of Colorado's most infamous early residents, Elizabeth McCourt Doe, later and better known as Baby Doe Tabor, came to Central City and the Teller House. By all accounts, Baby Doe was a beautiful, lively, sociable young lady, largely unconstrained by the strict social norms of the Victorian age. Some of the, the most rare artifacts are that of the original furniture created for Baby Doe Tabor. When she married Horace Tabor, she married the richest man in Colorado, except that he was already married to another woman. And so he had to hide Baby Doe in a private suite in the Windsor Hotel, which he also owned in Denver. That furniture that was in the suite was designed for her and crafted for her because she was only four feet 11, and it, it's gilded in gold. When the Windsor Hotel was torn down in Denver in the 1960s, the Teller House and the Central City Opera Association acquired the furniture, and because Baby Doe Tabor was such a character here in Central City, the Central City Opera Association commissioned an opera about her in 1956, The Ballad of Baby Doe, and what are called Doe Heads come from all over the country to see the show. This chickering grand piano that I'm sitting next to, it is made of Brazilian rosewood, and it was actually dedicated and donated to the Opera Association by Douglas Moore, the composer of the Ballad of Baby Doe. Baby Doe returned to Central City and the Teller House many times to enjoy the opera. Alas, the silver crash of 1893 wiped out Tabor's fortune, and he died in 1899. Baby Doe tried many times to restart Tabor's matchless mine, but failed and was found frozen to death in a mining shack in 1935. In 1878, the Central City Opera House opened 
bringing another level of culture and sophistication to the mountain gold rush town. That year also brought the Colorado Central Railroad, making it possible to travel in luxury from New York or Chicago all the way to Central City in your private luxury rail car. However, that year may have marked the peak of Central City's prominence and riches. Once the easily accessible gold was mined, it became harder and more expensive to pull gold out of the ground. New and larger strikes in Leadville, Aspen and Cripple Creek drew both investors and miners to those outposts. The establishment of Denver as the capital of the new state of Colorado in 1876 spurred the move of many of Central City's most prominent citizens out of the mountains to the Queen City of the Plains. Although Central City continued to prosper through the 19th century, by 1920, Central City was almost a ghost town. Soon, however, the tide would turn. During the depth of the Great Depression, two extraordinary women, Ida Cruz McFarland and Ann Evans, led the restoration of the abandoned, rotting, and rat-infested Central City Opera House to its former glory. They attracted the best theatrical talent of the day to produce world-class operas, musicals, and other shows during a summer festival. Audiences came from around the world for shows and the lively nightlife of Central City. Evans chaired the Central City Opera House Association Board of Directors and was the primary driver of both fundraising and artistic excellence for the Central City Summer Festival. Ann Evans was able to gather a group of people together from the community and uh, from day one create something that was important in North America. She was a force to be reckoned with. She was able to draw uh, people in, uh, artists and um, directors, to help recreate what was once a very fabulous opera and town. In 1932, Ann Evans leased the first two floors of the Teller House and began restoration of the neglected and largely abandoned building. The Teller House became a vital element of Central City Opera's summer festival. Patrons of the opera relied on its bathrooms. The opera house had none. Restaurant, and most famously, its bar, both before and after the shows. Ann Evans started the restoration in the face bar, which was historically the billiard hall. And in that billiard hall were original frescoes painted uh, by Stanley St. George. And the original eight images were of Grecian or Roman goddesses and gods and each one was intentionally painted with a flaw. And so they're very exciting to look at even still today. The most famous painting in the face bar, however, was not painted until 1936, when a bitter dispute fueled a drunken act of revenge, inspired by a romantic poem. Ann Evans hired Herndon Davis, a prominent artist, to restore the frescoes. However, Herndon Davis was a lush, and he could not enter the bar room without having too many drinks. And Ann Evans personally fired him, and he was pretty upset by that. He was friends with Poncho Gates, a set designer and painter for the Opera Association. And Poncho and Herndon got drunk and took their new box of paints and together painted the face on the bar room floor. Years later, inspired by both the fictional poem and the actual painting, the Central City Opera Association commissioned a one-act opera, The Face on the Barroom Floor, set in the Teller House during the 19th century. The image is still there, and it's one of the most famous and prominent pieces of history here in Central City today. On July 16, 1932, the restored Central City Opera staged its first opera, Camille starring Lillian Gish and directed by famed director Robert Edmund Jones. Evans invited all attendees to dress in the styles of 1872 when the Opera House originally opened. There was a grand gala and, and if you think about what a grand gala would look like in 1872, sort of in your mind's eye, that was it. You know, ladies in, in corsets with big flowing gowns and men dressed to the nines with top hats and canes. And there was a renaissance here in Central City. And with the Summer Opera Festival uh, showing every summer, people from Denver and from all over the world came. The Teller House became a center of social activity in Central City with food and drink, parties, music and entertainment before and after opera performances. 
As famed columnist Lucius Beebe wrote in his syndicated column, at the moment of writing, the town is almost deafeningly animated as a result of the annual music festival. The Central City Opera Summer Festival continues today with a rich offering of operas and other musical entertainment, as does another activity common in Central City since its earliest days, gambling. Central City, gold, and gambling are all one and the same thing, and they always have been for their entire history. These miners who came out to Colorado had nothing to do when they weren't in the mines other than drink and gamble. And so really for the entire town's history, it's been a place known for its games of chance and for its alcohol. In 1995, gambling was legalized in Central City. Central City welcomed gambling, but it also chose to preserve its historic atmosphere by limiting the size and style of the casinos that operate there. Preserving the history in Central City, preserving the buildings, preserving the stories, preserves Colorado. Uh, it sets a foundation for home for a lot of people. I think preserving the history allows us all to look back and enjoy what, what came from all of this hard work what pain and torture the pioneers went through to start Central City and the miners and all the work that they did. I think those really help us to be more fully aware of life. One of the, the most wonderful things about the Teller House is the fact that you feel the presence of these people in the house. You feel the history. When you hear a story about the governors and the dignitaries that came to Central City and stayed in the Teller House or met with people in the Teller House, it is an all-encompassing historical experience. I think of all of the buildings in Central City, the Teller House is the most fantastic, is the most opulent, is really the most accommodating, has the most detail, has the most character. There is a lot of history here. When I walk into the Teller House front door, I'm always dazzled by the look and the elegance of the place. It's been through a lot of interesting times. It's a beautiful space, and I can only imagine what it was like when it was originally built. The spirit of Central City is its history. It's the gold mining, um, anything can happen, make the most of every day, uh, enjoy your music, enjoy your life, and look to the fortune that you have and the fortune that you want to make.